Hello everyone and welcome to this Nintendo Life episode 226! My name is NBZ and uh, you know it's taken me months of long, hard sweat, toil, labour, but Bally finally... I am the Elden Lord. Bow down, kneel t before me as I am the one who rules over all now. I, uh, I did a tweet I am pretty proud of. Yeah, it was, I did like that one. Yes, it was quite good. Uh, what was it? Lord Elden BZ? Uh, Lord Elden BZ, yeah. Yeah, no, very good. Uh, riffing on my, uh, my social media handle, which for years has always been Lord NBZ because... Um, because of reasons, this is the thing with the internet, right? It's like you can't have a three-letter name or a username anywhere. They just don't let you. They're like, no, minimum six characters, minimum like eight characters plus a fucking like punctuation mark or, or a number in it, right? Um, and so when I was younger, I remember logging onto the school computers and like NBZ being my password at school. Or remember? Okay, so remember at school <laughs> where, password. where we had the same password and our password was OB, as in OB1. <laughs> it was just OBI. That was our password was at when you were allowed a password that was that short yeah exactly like there was there was no uh kind of like ideas about what password security was or any of that nonsense it was just like hey just pick something that you think you're gonna remember i've got an even more hilarious like everyone related story okay go for it yeah so for the millennium way back in 2000 obviously um i just decided like the first word i was gonna say of the new millennium was Obi-Wan Kenobi. And I remember <laughs> when the millennium passed and I was with everyone, I just said to myself, Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> so the first word I ever said of the new millennium was Obi-Wan Kenobi. Wow, that's a way yeah. to mark the thousand years. The biggest biggest uh, fan over here. No, that's pretty cool. How many people do you reckon in the world at that point in time also said Obi-Wan <laughs> Kenobi is the first words after the millennium passed? I mean, yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past the Star Wars fandom. So no, probably, totally. We'll see. Yeah, no, that is very funny, though. Probably, I mean, what were you, like, nine, ten yep, years nine old? years old, yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, that's what we would do. Um, I think another one of my passwords was L-O-T-R. We're just fucking doxing ourselves here, but of course, like, this is school what? computers back in the day. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it was it was funny back then of, of we having... Were, well, I was, we were both absolutely insanely big Star Wars fans. Still are, but yes. I remember... Yeah kind of funny recently was talking about like what's the film you've seen the most at theaters and they are big like movie buffs and things so mm -hmm. i was expecting oh, i saw this film like 10 times this and they all said like yeah i saw like last star wars twice i saw this i think we saw oh, i saw phantom menace like six times in the cinema yeah yeah, I don't um, think I was that many. I was three, probably. Three. And a couple of those probably with you as well. Right. So, um, but yeah, no, Phantom Menace was... And then afterwards, when it came out on VHS, then I just wore that tape out, oh, you know? Oh, then the, the floodgates opened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, basically could practically tell you the entire um, script uh, line by line at that point yeah. in time. But um, anyway, uh, I don't know how we got here, but I am the Elden yeah. Lord Bally. Uh, Elden and Lord. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I finally, after... Actually, it took me 98 hours, so it only took me about an hour to do those last kind of stretch of bosses that is record time when you hear a lot of others talking about that game yeah i don't know i thought i was a good level i was like 150 ish and um, is there much more you want to explore and see uh potentially yeah like there there are some things i could go and do or would um, you rather just start a new game well you can do you can do new game plus which means oh, okay. you basically carry everything over and so it's a lot of people call it the revenge run because you go through and you just basically demolish all the bosses <laughs> that were giving you a hard time first time through um which is a fun thing to do and because you can respec uh now i have a bunch of respec items i can go and change my uh my build set up to like something very different and especially because i have basically explored so much and have so much stuff of for uh, other builds that i could use if i change my stats up um that yeah i might do that and, and see what i fancy and then jump into a new game plus and just roll around probably as like a big magic blasting uh, person and, and see how that goes um but yeah i basically i finished it yesterday morning and then spent pretty much the rest of the day just watching videos lore videos about the game uh watching video essay stuff joseph anderson put out a video on it so i was i watched that whole two hour thing um yeah it's one of those games that like after you finish i'm like i just want to absorb all the other stuff on the internet internet about it because it's such an interesting fascinating thing so um yeah and bali you, you started your adventure just in that, started and, uh, just started yeah we talk a bit, little bit about that on our uh, our patreon show so uh, head on over there if you want to check that out but mm -hmm. uh we are going to talk about some other stuff on today's show bali what are we going to be doing 
for the first segment, we're going to talk about the games that we have been playing. The second segment, we got some emails, and we were recording a bit ahead of time, so we didn't want to cover any news or anything, so we went with a bit of the jukebox. It's, it's back, back again, baby, very quickly after the last time, but, uh, you know, people like it. It's a fun thing to do, uh, and, you know, I need some more revenge on Bally, so it needs to happen. So I will be testing Bally in the jukebox, uh, giving him five video game songs to guess, and we'll see how he does. But uh, let's get into the video games, what we have been playing. Um, and, Bally, uh, you had not finished Cuphead last time, but you've now not. finished up the delicious last course, including oh. the secret boss that I told you about um, that you had to go boss. and find. Um, how how was it wrapping this thing up? I think they're probably the best bosses in the game. I, I found the final the final regular boss and then the final so you got like the the chess piece challenges as it were i thought yes. they were incredibly cool so I, I wrapped up like the last three or four of those as, as well and then the final boss itself i found very challenging i i think the, the one just before the final boss i did was fine but what the final boss itself i thought was very challenging and then there's a secret final boss so i also did that one mm -hmm. um so yeah i think these are some of the best designed bosses not just of this game but probably of like you know it's cuphead so it's like it's come some of the best bosses ever to be honest and i yeah. think it's just i really am excited to know what they're gonna do next and if cuphead's ever gonna come back or they're gonna do a sequel but at the same time the level of animation and effort it takes to make just the most intricate and impressively designed bosses like it must just take ages so I yeah don't... i don't know if you saw on twitter one of the artists was posting the stills and like the kind of like uh, sketches of that dog fight one where like the oh. tongue comes out and the dog standing on it like they showed the like in between animations of it and just seeing it sketch out on paper it was very very cool to see um lots of that stuff going around i think at the moment um from that team so yeah it's obviously takes years and years of like perfecting it to make sure it's so tight and and make sense i think that's the thing that is the most impressive to me is like you have to make sure that not only is the animation fantastic but the animation has to be at so that quality synced yeah timed perfectly for the the kind of like momentum of the fight and like making sure that players have enough like the the right enough window to dodge it but also it's fast enough to where it's a challenge right like that's the perfect balance that they have struck with this dlc and generally with cuphead i think overall is is that ability to have such a tightly tuned fight that feels incredibly well balanced but like really challenging in the correct ways um and yeah i think that's the thing that probably takes the most time is like okay well maybe we did all this animation but we need to change this thing and so we need to restart doing that over again right and i'm sure they had a bunch of ideas for boss fights because i think they had some left over from the original game um some of which i think maybe made it into this game um mm. but uh but yeah it's it's probably a lot of just balancing things and and kind of iteration right like over time that takes, yeah uh, you I, th know. I think we'll look back on portal in 20 30 years and be like wow that was a an important moment like in video games and like where art styles could go in the kind of the 21st century i guess it's just so yeah i think it's just gonna age so well totally um so yeah uh cuphead the delicious last course it was tasty um bali you've also been playing something new uh that nintendo dropped uh something old that yeah. is now something something new. old that is now new again uh i've been playing portal one as part of the portal companion collection yeah i believe called? that's what it's called i mean yeah. it says it's a collection but when you download the companion collection it literally just downloads portal one and two as two separate games onto your switch so you don't actually go into a single um app as it were huh, that's weird because you would expect like if they're doing it as a collection, they would have it under one banner on one menu and everything, but they just have yeah, to... Yeah, it's probably quicker just to do it as two quick separate things. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know. It, cut a it makes there? me wonder if they will sell them separately at any point in time. Um, mm, but maybe. But I, I don't know. Uh, they have um, to get quite cheap, I guess, because it's already relatively cheap uh, coming on the eShop uh, at this point yeah, in time anyway. Yeah, like £13.50, so. I think, yeah. spent on it. So that's both games. Um, yeah, and I'm maybe like a third of the way through the sort of campaign the story of, of portal one um and it runs really well on switch like at 60 fps there's a little bit of loading between levels occasionally but it's like yeah. a very brief screen you have the elevators that basically take you to the next puzzle yeah. room, right yeah yeah it's just on the and you can like you can do like a manual save and it's constantly auto saving as well and just been playing it on my fixed dress one and it, it just it feels really nice like playing handheld and just it's I've never touched Portal before. I'm obviously aware of what it is and that everyone absolutely loves this game. And I'm kind of 
falling in line with all the consensus about that game to be honest because i'm an hour in and it's very very impressive i think that i had forgotten a lot about portal in the sense that i th I th obviously knew about the portals and that right you put the cube through here it goes on the switch and then they basically mess around with that that mechanic in loads of ways but it's so much more deep than that because there's so much gravitational stuff and mm -hmm. you must jump from this height down into the portal to get enough momentum to fly over to this side and then and then i remembered oh yeah this must be why mbz felt sick at this uh -huh. game because this yeah. is like incredibly like loads of motion going on and it's just disorienting when you enter through one uh, direction and then you basically if you like go you can see yourself as well i think that's one of the cleverest things about portal is even though it's a first person game you can see your character model a lot of the time if you place portals mm. in the correct way where like you can you can be like behind yourself or there's a mirror behind you and then you kind of like look look at your, the back of yourself um or you will have a portal in the side of a wall and you'll be looking through it and it'll be looking downwards because the other one is at the in the ceiling or something like that um and yeah it, it gets quite disorienting because they have to account for that and then like flip you back to the correct position that you would be gravitationally this is, this is an, an americanism alert is disorienting is american and disorientating, disorientating yes. is yes. the british but yeah, just yeah. That um yes. I, I did my first puzzle where you create a portal you fall through and then using the momentum you've already got from falling through you then have to shoot another portal mid falling to maintain your momentum fall through another portal and then you you like leapfrog over a hurdle basically that's too too high um and it's stuff like that that made me really like god this is just so damn damn clever like mm -hmm. did it come out in 2011 it, no this original game so this came out with the orange box originally on console um basically valve put out this product called the orange box that was it was kind of a combination of a bunch of things at the time. It had one of the Half-Life 2 episodes. Maybe it had Half-Life 2 itself in it. Um, it also had Team Fortress 2. Um, and it had this experimental little thing called Portal, which was a thing that Valve had... They basically um, found these students. These students were working on this project. And Valve were like, this is impressive tech. Let's uh, let's bring these guys in-house and see what they can do. And, and they basically turned that prototype into the, what would be the original Portal. And it was like, because it's only a three-hour thing, they were like, yeah, let's just add this onto this collection that we're putting out there um and it turned out that portal was like by far the most successful thing from the orange box um and as a result and what year was that i think like 2007 i want to wow, say um, a long time ago. Okay. yeah it's it's pretty old and um and yeah so as a result of that they they greenlit a sequel and, and the sequel came out in 2011 so it was okay in 2011 when i got my ps3 portal 2 was the first new game that i bought it come out in the april of 2011 and i got my ps3 in around june or july of that year so the first game that i bought that was a brand new game um was portal 2 i think i got final fantasy 13 and portal 2 were the first games i got for my ps3 mm. um so yeah it was it was one of those like i had seen the ign review of like giving it a 10 and stuff like that so i knew it was a very high quality game but i didn't really know that much about portal 2 going into it um and then yeah playing it for the first time was pretty mind-blowing um just just learning all that stuff uh, and yeah i didn't play the original portal until a bit later when i got my pc and then kind of played it with keyboard and mouse which actually for me is less disorientating um because i uh i don't know something about that is a bit smoother with the mouse movement and everything versus mm. being on console i think it was a little trickier with portal 2 but um, mm. yeah um and i think the setting of the game is quite cool it's kind of eerie and you're kind of working out what is what is this all leading to and mm -hmm. the dialogue from your like computer lady is quite funny and it i think people have been very at the time i think people were really impressed by that dialogue i think there's been a lot of takes on that dialogue since to the point where now that you play it it's like it's cool but it's not like revolutionary in the way that i think people have talked about that dialogue before whereas the mechanics are the bit for me that are still just like yeah this isn't it's is probably a podcast game for me is what i mean like i, I oh interesting of the, most of the well because the the dialogue's only maybe at the start and end of levels anyway so yeah, there's long it, periods it's... in between where you're working out what on earth to do next where get that podcast on yeah there's there's kind of like um downtime i guess while you're figuring out the puzzle because you don't really want someone chatting in your ear as you're trying to kind of like figure out what you're supposed to do because right. it's a lot of you know in your own head um i yeah I, I don't know if a lot of people would say the original portal is the one that that really nails it on the writing front i would say portal 2 is the one where a lot more of that comes in because um so like glados who's the your evil kind of computer lady she's 
she's like an important character in both games but in the second game you have a character called wheatley who's played by stephen merchant uh, and that was one of the big selling points of the game back in the the day when that came out and you can imagine 2011 like stephen merchant very relevant back then um mm. and uh, and yeah that, there was a lot more time put into the writing because he's a constant companion character throughout the game as you go okay. through um so it's a lot more chatter happening there um and there's yeah there's a, there's multiple characters that kind of bounce off each other and do interesting things in portal 2 um even though you're still a silent protagonist um it, it still has a lot more of that stuff and you know there's there's definitely funny and humorous stuff in the original portal probably a bit more of it backloaded um so you won't have come across it yet but um but yeah i would say portal 2 is generally what people refer to i would say when it comes to like the great writing of that series um even though the first one is pretty decent so yeah yeah been been quite busy so i've only played about an hour and a half an hour third of the way through but i'll beat it for next time and mm-hmm. i am just incredibly impressed and i'm so glad it came if i finally had a way of playing portal in a simple uh digestible way because it's yeah. been too long and you like that. maybe even surprising it's been this long that it took for portal to come to the switch yeah, it's I don't know. It's very weird. Valve have been have a weird relationship with their games and console for years. Like the Portal Two thing was really interesting because basically Gabe Newell came out on on stage at one of Sony's press conferences, probably in twenty eleven or twenty ten, I would guess, the year before it came out, and um, and he was like the ps3 we're gonna have portal on it and guess what it's gonna be cross play with pc like one of the earliest examples of that um which is crazy and one of the things that happened was if you bought the ps3 version of portal 2 you got a pc copy of it which is why i have a steam account my steam account name is psn underscore lord nbz because to register my pc copy of portal i had to create a steam account that's when i made my steam account was when i got portal 2 um so i registered it just to be like well i I might as well just like get this added to whatever account on pc um and then like i slowly accumulated like random free games before i actually got my pc so actually when i started my steam library i remember having that steam library and having like a humble bundle on it already and stuff like that because uh you know i I thought you know at some point i'm going to have a computer that can run games properly uh, and yeah i had a kind of nice start to it but yeah that's why when i made my steam account it suggested like psn underscore i was like okay whatever like i didn't really care because my intention wasn't really to to make that a big deal but um anyway uh that's it's it's an interesting uh kind of history that the series has with console and what it's done Mm. which is why it is surprising that you know all these years later they're like oh okay well we're just gonna put it on switch now it's like okay does that mean they're gonna maybe do half-life stuff at some point soon or anything else is portal 3 I mean, Valve doesn't understand what the number three uh, is, Valley. They just don't. It doesn't make sense to them. Uh, they can't count that high. They've tried. They just can't do the math. The abacuses just don't work that way uh, over at uh, their offices. So, um, yeah, uh, exactly. So that's that's good. That's fun to hear. Uh, I'm excited to see you continue through that and then play the second game. And, uh, and then at some point, I'll probably pick that up and we can play the co-op, co-op campaign. campaign of yeah. two, um, which I have never played uh, and I've always wanted to play. Um, and yeah, I think this is a good opportunity to uh, come Great. to Switch. So look forward to it. Uh, I have continued, Bally, to play Fall Guys. Uh, I'm now level 50 on the Battle Pass. So I'm halfway through the Battle Pass. So if that tells you how much uh, Fall Guys I've played, um, probably a significant amount. Um, Did you hear on Kind of Funny that Gary and Snowbike Mike both yeah. got that achievement of five wins in a row? That is uh, just disgusting to me. <laughs> I don't understand how that's possible. How, how did they do that? I have no idea. I would imagine it would be through squads or through duos, right? Like doing that solo. Mm. I don't. I don't know. I'm sure someone has done that, but that sounds like a fucking impossibility. Doing it solo to win five in a row, um, because winning in squads and winning in duos, you don't get a full crown. You basically get these shards of a crown, um, and then those shards add up to give you a full crown. When I was looking at the, um, there's one of the, there's a bunch of different fucking like battle passy style like things of like, oh, this one's for the Halo. Uh, uh, event we're doing this one's for your dailies and weeklies this one's for the actual battle pass there's one for how many crowns you get and so i when i got my first crown i got uh, level one on that thing and i started looking through and it goes up to like five thousand i'm like how the fuck who, who is getting five thousand crowns like i didn't understand it but then what i realized is a lot of the achievements that you get include like shards of crowns as rewards so like one of them for example is like i don't know 
play 100 rounds and then by doing that you get 210 of these shards and 60 shards is enough to get you one crown basically so by doing that achievement i i would have gotten like three crowns out of doing that achievement where i didn't actually win anything um but it still puts me it puts me on the treadmill of that kind of like uh you know leveling system as it were and uh and yeah so i'm now level five in terms of crowns even though i've won only i want to say four times and those four times the other times that is not a solo win have all been squads uh wins which means that i get like just a few shards for like 20 or so for winning that but because i've done other achievements that have unlocked those other shards um I think me saying this it instantly makes me realize, Valley, your your whole point about like currencies and stuff like that. It's just that's like, what all these games do. They have so many currencies. It's like, is that the one you pay for? Is that the one that yeah. you win? Is that right. the one that's a bit of a combination of the two? Yeah. So like this whole crown system with the shards is is an interesting thing. And um, I yeah, I've I've basically the way I basically play Fall Guys is i hop in and i look at what my daily um kind of things to do are my kind of checklist of like what do, what i have to do and oftentimes what they will give you is okay qualify from any round in duos or squads or one of those things and duos has been cropping up a lot and uh, i've been getting very annoyed by this ballet because duos obviously depends on the person you're paired with right so if you get paired with someone who's a bit shit getting past the first round can be a bit of the pain in the ass because you obviously if you finish in a good position that's great and happy but you have to rely on the other person to also finish in a decent position so you actually qualify from that first round and i swear to god like there was a couple of nights ago where i was trying to do these duos games and like six games in a row i i got like really um far up in the ranking of the first round and my partner was just a shit muncher who was just like bobbling around like <laughs> clearly had no idea what the fuck was going on i'm like why are they pairing me with these terrible people all the time and then sometimes i, I go into duos and i don't even have a partner and i don't know am i cursed like are they deliberately like shitting on me for some reason that they don't want me to do these achievements but like i actually yesterday i did one where i didn't have a partner got through the first round and i had enough points to actually get through on my own and then i was in the second round and i was like well i guess it's literally impossible like i i it was a survival round and i survived the whole mm. time but it was literally impossible for me to qualify because i didn't have a partner um and i think that's a little bit shitty of all guys like if mm. you're going to I, they try and populate a full 60 but if you can't like at least populate it so that it works out that there's not an odd number of people like at least make it like 56 instead of 57 because clearly i was number 57 without a fucking partner so it was it was really annoying um and yeah that that can happen quite a lot so i don't know maybe duos i'm cursed i just need to wait for you to play and then actually have someone who's good who can play alongside me so i can do those things but um yeah i think that uh that's really been a little bit of frustration uh in terms of like just being paired with random people which is why i think solos is better to play but the thing is like they tie they tie a lot of the level up stuff to play in duos so if you want to get 300 which is like half a level basically for the battle pass they kind of force you into doing that which i get it because it, I, i'm sure most people play solos and there's a like less number of people who are playing um in in the duos and squad format um they just want to fill up those lobbies a bit more right um so yeah it totally makes sense uh the other thing that they have added which is a kind of limited time mode is a it's like a um thieves and robbers type of mode where there are four uh, four characters who are basically the um kind of guards and they have to capture you and there are eight characters who can go run around and they can turn invisible so you can turn invisible and you have to steal candy from the other side of the field and then slowly bring it back while avoiding obstacles if you get hit by an obstacle your invisibility will disappear and someone will see where you are so it's about this kind of careful just like hiding in plain sight um stealing the candy and then running away and also if you get put in jail there's a big red button in the middle of the arena so if you're the last person alive and all your people have been put in jail you can still get up there and hit that button and just free them all again and let them all, all run out onto the field um but basically if the timer runs out then the guards win so it's it, it feels like it's balanced right so the guards have fewer people um they can capture you quite easily 
but also you can escape. And if um, the guards win, who gets through to the next round? Well, there's no round. It's just a single round thing. It's basically. a separate mode. It's yeah, a it's a totally thing. separate okay. mode. So you only you only queue up for this, and you basically just play one round of it, essentially. Um, hmm. And uh, they have different achievements tied to it, like the Halo thing, where um, you could go and get the Master Chief helmet if you did all of those rounds. Where I think the Halo one was less interesting because it was basically regular rounds, but they just put a bunch of exploding balls around the arena. Whereas this is a more tailored, like different mode. Um, hmm. I think it's called Sweet Thieves or something. Um, where yeah you're basically stealing candy from one side and uh, and then kind of like slowly trying to get it to the other side it's it has a um you remember that animal crossing game from nintendo land kind of has that feel about oh, it um, yeah. you know yeah. uh, with just with more people right and not being an asymmetric type of thing um i guess it is an asymmetric type of thing because uh, your guards and, and other people are thieves so um yeah it's uh, it's a really fun little mode and uh, yeah i continue to really enjoy fall guys i think it's just a uh, a good hop in and play um it's a great podcast game uh, again sometimes i just don't even have the volume turned up i'm just jumping in and playing and uh, yeah really really easy chill relax easy to put up on switch as well and just you know just run through and, and do some some games so um yeah i my intention is to try and finish the battle pass which i'm halfway through now with 50 levels and and doing it kind of like being a bit more targeted about it with like the weekly challenges and stuff like that um it feels good just kind of like getting through that stuff and uh Still have yet to got, get a second win, but um, no you know, more solo there's, wins. there's time. There's time. Uh, I'm sure I'll get one eventually, uh, and uh, at some point, Bali, uh, you will as well. So I will. we'll I will. get there. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, is Delta Rune. Uh, so Delta Rune Chapter One came out a few years ago, like 2018, I want to say. I remember being in Edinburgh and playing it on my laptop back then. It basically was a surprise as drop. As one does. And uh, Toby Fox was like, "Hey, here's this thing," and people were like, "What the fuck?" He just did put out this free thing, and I was uh, I was like, "Well." I can probably run that on my laptop, right? Because I probably couldn't run anything else, but I could run that. So uh, I decided to play it through there. And um, since then, I've been like, well, now he's put it out on Steam. He also put it out on Switch. And um, he also has released a second chapter. And it's also free. Um, and I kind of wanted to jump into the second chapter, but I kind of forgotten what happened in the first game because it had been so long. And with these games, Undertale and, and Deltarune, being so story-focused, I thought it would be a good idea to replay the first chapter and then play chapter two as well. But it's really hard for me to replay stuff that I've already played. So I always kept putting it off and I was like, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do this. And it was end of last year when it came out. And then I just got around to it, um, start of this year. And I decided, uh, let's jump in, let's let's replay chapter one on Switch uh, and then play chapter two on Switch as well. And uh, so that's what I did. Um, so I played chapter one uh, probably a month or so ago, a month and a half ago, and then um, hopped back into chapter two recently. And uh, yeah, I, I really like Deltarune and what he's doing with it. It's a really interesting premise where it feels like you have to have some context for Undertale to get the most out of Deltarune in the sense that it is all the same characters um but it feels like an alternate universe right like it you could see the threads in which it is like a sequel or at least is taking place after the events of undertale but no one's really clear about that stuff um the, it's basically like you you live in this town it's very earthbound style town of course toby fox very inspired by earthbound um but like it's like a regular kind of on it style thing where you have all these monsters but they're just like living their normal lives unlike an undertale where they're like underground is where they live and it's this weird magical world um they just are living regular lives in the town you have like um your main character chris who um interestingly at the start of chapter one you, you try and design them and um you're like okay we're doing a character creator thing and then the game is like no you have no agency here which is a really interesting like i think the theme and the idea that toby fox is playing with here is like undertale was a game about choice and about player agency and about what you can do to affect things and instantly he kind of like rips that away from you at the very beginning like giving you this idea of this character creator and then just ripping it away and saying no nope, you, you don't have any choice in this world uh, is a really interesting take on things um and like meta textually is also interesting because there's this kind of this idea that the fandom of undertale kind of like ran with this thing and it became this thing that was like at a point toby fox was like this is too big like what is happening like he i remember him at one point telling one of the big streamers like please don't stream this game because uh i don't want it to get any bigger than it has it's just basically ballooned out of control there are multiple fascinating video essays on the fandom of undertale and like how massive it is and how all-encompassing and like crazy it is and um and i think there's like some something kind of like meta textually here about toby fox saying like no i'm kind of resting control back of this from the fans in the sense and of how like, is he actually doing that other than telling a streamer not to do it 
well i mean through the through the game itself right like oh, that whole okay, like right. that, my point is that by by ripping away this idea of choice in the game he is he is kind of almost uh this is a metatextual read on it right like this is not something that i don't know if he intends or not but like the idea of of him almost taking control back again uh, is an is an interesting um thought experiment in, in essence but um but i think delta rune is a it feels more like a straightforward jrpg in a sense because it is party based so the idea is that you you're these, this kid and you go to school and there's this bully character called Susie, and you just you end up uh, falling into this this other world in the cupboard and um both chapters so far have followed a pretty pretty similar formula which is you start off in the town you go to school and then you fall into this underworld area and then you have to fight through there with a bunch of different characters who exist in this underworld place um and you have to like uh, there's this fountain which is like spewing out darkness and you basically have to heal it essentially um and the setup in terms of combat is somewhat different because you have three party members now um but it still has that whole idea of like dodging things and being merciful to enemies but the question is like is that really necessary here like when the 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 whole idea of the first game was like your ending is going to be dependent on like whether you were you know being a pacifist or whether you were killing enemies um everything kind of varied whereas here because of that idea that the toby fox is almost taking away the idea of choice um i don't know how much it matters but i have been playing it in a similar way to undertale where you are you know just trying to do the weird things where it'll be like okay i'm gonna act on this turn and my options are like dance with the guy or like tell him a joke or something and then it will eventually build up a bar and then that bar can be used to like uh you know use a mercy on them essentially and they just disappear off the battlefield and um yeah it's it's cool because you have these three different characters who do different things so Susie, uh if you wanted to is more of the offensive character has a big axe that can attack with uh rolse who is also a character who like weirdly looks like asriel from undertale um and people have lots of theories obviously about this game and that game and what's going on um so so yeah you and they're more of a healing type character so it feels like more of a traditional rpg setup um and then in the second chapter like it feels like it expands it a bit more in terms of you have some additional characters who join you down there um and every every section of i think undertale and deltarune do this where it feels really well paced that there's always something new and different happening uh whether it be something interesting mechanical where you're like running along and suddenly things are shooting at you and you're kind of doing a real-time thing where your character is moving and it shows your heart in the center and it's dodging out of things like uh when undyne was chasing you in undertale like it had that kind of feel to it this game does a lot of that stuff where you're like sliding down things and you're having to do it in real time um but also like weird little puzzle areas that are very funny like that are joke as well as puzzles at the same time um and, and the way that the game reacts to that stuff is is really cool so uh, i i think it's just like such a high level of writing um and humor that, that toby fox is able to pull off and the music is fantastic again like this this man is non-stop just bangers um i think he's actually doing a bunch of music for pokemon scarlet and violet as well uh, again because he did wow. i think he did one track in sword and shield um but now he's doing a bunch of i think he actually is doing like the main overworld theme or something for, cool. for scarlet and violet so yeah i think he's got a good relationship with game freak at this point in time which is very very cool um but yeah i mean what what talent to do to be able to pull off uh, all that stuff um and when is chapter three yeah i mean i think that at this point in time he said when that comes out when he does the next section of it it's going to be chapters three to five all at once so he's going to do a big drop of it basically and this time it's going to be paid so the first two free then he's going to start charging for it uh, as soon as that happened there's supposed to be seven chapters total um which is interesting because it's like a whole week uh beca because the way that the game is structured is like the first day is like your monday or whatever and the second day is the day after so it feels like every day is going to be like a subsequent one where they go to school then they go down into the hole and they you know find a different part of the world and i'm sure they'll find an interesting way to shake things up i i would say like it feels a little more not formulaic but a little more predictable than undertale in the sense of um it feels like there's a pattern that's going to emerge with what they're doing with it and i think the interesting thing for me will be if they break that pattern you know if they if they break away from your expectation that's where i'm going to be more interested because if they just continue to do this like okay every day we go there it'll be fun and i'll enjoy it and i think it's humorous and funny and there's great situations and um and the combat is enjoyable uh, but i i worry if it gets a little too um a little too samey potentially um but we'll see we'll see how it goes it's certainly a very interesting uh project uh, and i think you know as i said I, I think there's there's ways in which it's um 
kind of reflecting uh what uh, toby fox has gone through uh, as part of this whole process um yeah i, I mean I, I highly recommend watching a bunch of stuff on youtube about undertale and its success and and the way it it just blew up in this weird uh thing and just became the biggest thing on the internet um it's it's a it's a wild thing to uh to learn about so uh yeah uh but i like delta room i think it's good um and uh yeah i'm not i'm not one of those people again who is crazy about this series i think i have more respect for undertale the longer i get from it just because of i think the soundtrack is the thing that sticks with me the most and, and like mm. it's one of the best soundtracks of all time i think um and you know delta rune has that similar thing that similar uh kind of quality to it where you know i i enjoy playing it but i think it's the music that really imprints on me uh, and, and makes a lasting impression so uh anyway uh, i finally did it finally got around to delta rune chapter two glad i did um and yeah i, I think it's it's solid so I think we'll probably be waiting a few more years. I, the thing is, he has now he's now hired a bunch more people to help him make uh, the rest of it. So hopefully, it shouldn't take as long. Uh, but uh, you know, when it comes to stuff like this, uh, you know, uh, artists and, and perfection, they want to make things uh, as as good as possible. So, just like Cuphead, uh, could be a while waiting for it, but we shall see. Uh, all right. Well, that is going to close us out for the first part of the show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back after this break to answer some of your emails. See you in a bit. Welcome back to the second part of today's show. It is time for your emails. We're always looking for more emails. We're always looking for questions. We're always looking for comments. But if you would like to email us, please email thisnintendolife at gmail.com. That is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. We also have also have a dedicated channel on our Discord server. So head on over there to the emails channel and you can also post a comment, a question, a thought over there. Um, our first email this time is from Charlie says hi guys as a father of a 2.5 year old Bally's stories of late night baby shifts explosive puke and diarrhea and general state of chaos brings back fond memories good times <laughs> anyway my question for you both is how did the switch fare in terms of your favorite gaming franchises did the switch entries unseat your former favorite in the series and or did it disappoint for me, Switch pretty much nailed it across the board. It boasts my favourite Metroid, Mario and Kirby games. Fire Emblem Three Houses and Pokemon Sword and Shield are top tier titles in their series. It also introduced me to Shin Megami Tensei games with SMT5. So it's by default my favourite SMT game at the moment while I look into playing the rest. My only disappointment, and this is probably a controversial take, was Breath, Breath of the Wild. <laughs> Since my favourite aspect about Zelda games are the elaborate dungeons... Fortunately, Link's Awakening was fantastic. Gave me a Zelda to love on the Switch in the end. Great show, guys. Best of luck, Bally. Well, I Very think good. this email just needs to be discarded. <laughs> and because being like, Breath of the Wild, come on. Yeah, yeah. No, I know lots of people who have that take. Uh, which uh, I mean, I can't defend that it has elaborate dungeons. So if that's your favorite no. thing, that I totally get it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I think it is one of those things that will always be. Even games that are lauded as the greatest of all time uh, have polarizing elements to them, right? Like, there's definitely a lot of people who bounce off Elden Ring, and I think it's it's still, uh, you know, as much as people laud those types of games, um, you're always going to have people who don't kind of connect with them. Uh, it's always going to be a personal preferential uh, thing. You're never going to have something that appeals to everybody. So uh, yeah, I totally get it. Um, but uh, but yeah, this is interesting because uh, I think there was a bit of a narrative originally, like when the Switch first came out of like wow nintendo are hitting out of the park on every level with every new game they release um and i would say like that's certainly true for a lot of them uh, potentially uh, depending on your uh, your taste but um 
Uh, I, I think there's equal uh, kind of disappointment uh, in certain franchises and, and how things have been handled. So maybe we kind of just go through them uh, one by one and, and decide, Bally, uh, you know, are they the best? Are they not? And and what do we think about them? Okay. Um, I guess starting with Zelda, uh, yeah, I mean, Breath of the Wild for, for me and I guess for years, is, I think it's the best game ever made. So yeah, I think it's, it is the best uh, entry in the franchise. But also, it, it does feel like a new strand of Zelda, right? Like, if we think about traditional 3D Zelda, traditional 2D Zelda, Breath of the Wild doesn't really fit into those categories because it's it's a new type of Zelda in a way, right? Like, their approach to it and what they've done with it is it's just very different uh, and and i think that's part of the reason why a lot of people bounce off of it is because they're like this isn't zelda enough right where are my mm. uh, structured dungeons where are the things that like are very core to what the zelda experience is and i think um here's an interesting point i actually uh, do you remember that playing the dlc the first wave i believe yeah wave. yeah 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 they basically put quite well, it's longer than any of the shrines to my knowledge it basically put in like a dungeon in the DLC. a bonus dungeon bonus yeah dungeon. i think that was probably the best dungeon in the game actually yeah and arguably it was no longer maybe than the the thingy beast what are they called the the, the divine beast the divine yeah. beast so arguably those dungeons are much shorter than a traditional zelda dungeon perhaps but i, I think they are yeah that final dungeon was really well designed and i really did totally enjoy it, so i mean it was the, it was kind of the best you could do with the setup that they had i think part yeah. of the disappointment for people was that all those dungeons were visually quite similar because it had the kind of like uh the technology yeah. aspect to it and the the whole like moving parts of it while being inside it which i thought was an excellent idea like i think the first dungeon i did i kind of got spoiled up front because i went and did the camel first uh the one in the gerudo That's area the best of those four isn't which it? is yeah. the best dungeon and so like i coming out my first like 20 hours 30 hours of breath of the wild i was like well this is going to be the best game uh in terms of zelda dungeons as well yeah. you know i did do gerudo last and i'm glad i did it because it is probably the best Part yeah everything after that was a disappointment for me basically because i remember like doing the rito one i'm like well this is a bit shitty especially because the lead up is also a bit shitty for the rito one it's like you go into this little arena the, with the some... ruto the ruto uh you... yes uh, is it ruto i yeah. yeah i guess it is i don't know you're the wind waker person you know better than me ruto. ding Hello, editing NBZ here to correct Bally's erroneous assertion that Ruto is the name of the bird tribe in Zelda is in fact the Rito. I was correct. Uh, Ruto, however, is the name of the princess, the Zora princess from Ocarina of Time, I believe. Uh, and I don't know why Bally thought that was the case because he's Wind Waker boy. Uh, but now we might have to revoke his fan card. He might not be number one Wind Waker fan anymore because of this terrible uh, unforgivable mistake um i hope you all chide him greatly anyway back to the show ding um so yeah i went to that area and you drop into the place where you do the bow and arrow thing and then they're like anyway off we go to the beast now i'm like well the gerudo stuff had this whole setup of going to the area sneaking through yeah. the bananas there is all the 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 um the snowy mountains by the ruto that's very cool although it doesn't yeah, directly but... link necessarily to the beast as no much. no that's just exploration stuff and it has my favorite but one of my favorite puzzles in the game where you have to look for the bird and you get up to the top you're like oh, where's yeah. the bird and you're like oh they mean like look at the landmass that looks like yeah. a bird like oh my god such Great a cool stuff. fucking moment um but uh but yeah i think the lead up to some of those was just a bit weak compared to the gerudo one is just the best well-built one overall the town yeah. is the best town the lead up with going to that area and sneaking through the banana stuff there's a bonus boss fight at the end of that which is great fun and then you do the whole surfing through the sand like knocking the camel down like the camel itself is amazing just the best sequence in the game and i did it first so i think it like it just kind of ruined everything else in terms of quality there um but that said i do yeah i do think that that is the best entry in the series uh so far um it's, it's definitely up there for me um um, for Mario, we got 2D Mario and we got 3D Mario, and I think these fare slightly differently. Um, and 3D Mario is interesting because we got like the other strand of 3D Mario as well because they put they put 3D World on Switch, but they mm. also added Bowser's Fury to it, something which we both still haven't played, uh, you know, because we already own 3D World. Um, but Bali, I'm, I'm going to guess that you're saying that 3D Mario on Switch is is the best it's ever been with Odyssey. Yeah, Odyssey is my favorite Mario, 3D Mario for sure. Um, I think the way they reinvent that formula i just really really enjoyed and having played the other three 3d marios very recently with the collection other than mario galaxy 2 um i think that kind of reaffirmed in my mind that it is my favorite yeah it's uh it's very very good uh i think it is an exception like i think the first like playthrough of odyssey 
barring doing the hundred percent. I think the hundred percent can get a little bit not boring, but like it's it can get a little. It's quite it's quite a lot. It's because it turns the game from a ten hour game to a fifty hour game. It really, yeah. Often hundred percent might turn a, a fifteen hour game into a twenty five hour game, whereas this is right. really kind of multiplying it by five, which is quite unique. Yeah, I think the the fact that you have nine 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 as your match for moons is uh yeah, so it's, it's a little much, but it's also because they didn't actually give you 999 moons like in terms of challenges they gave you like 800 and something but then you can go process i really enjoyed and found very satisfying just like really getting the real minutiae of every single one of those worlds and using the amiibos to get the clues on the map and stuff that was a bit of a faff but it was good i enjoyed it yeah totally um i i think that the just buying the moons was the issue of like well i'm just going to do this one section in the bowser level where you can easily go in this road and you can collect i don't remember watching a game explain video being like okay just do this like for an hour and you'll have enough coins to buy every moon so uh, i remember doing that and that being a little tedious but there's but... a limit on the moons you can buy yeah well there's actually i think they're infinite there's a point at which you get i think in the uh the end when you get to the the castle uh, and you're talking to the toads you can the, you can basically buy infinite up to 999 um so yeah you there that, that's kind of how you fill it up at the end because i think there's really? 800 I yeah because it's like out and you had to go get no, the, the legit no, no, no. ones there's, there's like 880 i think but yeah. in order to get 999 you just buy infinite ones basically until you're done um so that's that's I how you get to 999 out. No, I mean, it, it, maybe it does, but that might mean there's like 200 of them. I think if if you don't collect all the things, I don't think the balloon goes gold. I think you need that. Like, you have to actually do the mechanical things of all the challenges to like get it to go gold. Otherwise, right? If just, you just yeah. if you just buy them all to 999, it won't yeah. maybe. Um, but you, in order to hit 999, you do need to go and just right. buy them. But we so. both got that gold balloon. Yes, which means we did every single challenge essentially yes. in the game in order yeah. to get it. Um, which, yeah, and I think that's the one thing that maybe holds Odyssey back as my favorite, uh, and the reason Galaxy 2 is still probably above it is because the level of platforming challenge in Odyssey doesn't quite stack up. I think it is so much more inventive and colorful and interesting in terms of its world design. But for me, I think I, from a 3D platformer, want a bit more of that challenge. And, like, the final challenge in Odyssey is hard, but it's nowhere close to, like, the heights of, like, the, the difficult stuff in, in Galaxy 2. Um, and some of that stuff, I think, too difficult, right? That very final level of Galaxy 2, a bit too much. Um, but I do think that the level of challenge in terms of the platforming is much more interesting and better in Galaxy 2 overall. Um, so I would probably, I'd probably have it just below that, but not far below it, you know? I think Odyssey is, I remember, like, that first 10 hours is just such an absolute delight it's such a surprising and, and fun adventure and like all the all the different places you go to and the wild things that you see um yeah it's, it's fantastic so it's it's pretty up there i would argue for most people it is it is the best one on switch and i can totally see that um i guess metroid is is next if we're talking about the triumvirate uh and uh yeah i mean there's an argument for metroid red being the best metroid game uh obviously i'm i'm biased towards fusion because that's my nostalgia pick and it's hard for me to kind of get away from that i know that game inside out it's like my favorite one of my favorite games of all time but i think metroid dread is uh, an exceptional game like probably the best 2d metroid overall and i'm guessing you would think that as well Bowen. yeah i think uh, i said before that all the other 2d metroids were much of a muchness for me i cut the kind of all the same level but i do think dread is uh a level above those other ones uh, for me and is the best 2d metroid uh now more recently we had kirby come out with uh the uh what do you call it forgotten sit forgotten the land forgotten land that we've yes. forgotten the name yeah totally um and uh i i think i've heard a lot of people talk about kirby as like this is the best game that i've ever played that's a 3d platformer and it's one of the best of the years i think the further i get from kirby not the least the less i like it but the less i'm like oh yeah that was amazing because i think it has some amazing moments in it and it's really good fun um but i don't know i don't i don't think i uh i think it is the best kirby game i think i still like canvas curse more personally uh, and i think that's just i lean more towards the weird creative side of kirby uh, and less so the uh the more traditional side and yes this is different because it's 3d kirby but it does kind of feel like a 2d kirby in a 3d kirby skin you know um it feels like the level design chops and everything is is very similar so i i really loved forgotten land and i think it's excellent but um yeah i do hear a lot of people being like oh this is easily game of the year material i'm like i i don't I know do question how many of those people have played canvas curse is my other point because it's a yeah, very old I, game at this point that's true but i also i don't know i think that those people are more into tra- traditional 3d platformers that's right also true. Um, so yeah and less yeah so I mean, I mean, comparing like a 2d stylus based platformer with a 3d 
platformers. Yeah, like, I guess. Difficult. Yeah, we we maybe have to split it up if we're talking about three D versus two D. But the hard thing with Kirby is there are. I guess it's the only three D Kirby. Yeah. That there's been, so I guess it is the best one. <laughs> Unless you want to talk about the N sixty four game, which is like two and a half D, right? Um, which isn't really the same. Yeah it's that that's a very vanilla game and I, I, vanilla in a bad way because you know i like my vanilla and uh-huh, yeah, yeah the crystal shards I, I don't rate um yeah i i agree i think canvas Curse is a more fun game it's probably my number one kirby forgotten land is a great game it's not at the heights that i think a lot of people reacted to when it came out i think it's it's a solid game will be up there on my game of the year don't get me wrong but it's not i think if you're talking about pure innovation and 3d platforming design that's where i think games like odyssey and it takes two are just so much better than kirby yeah totally yeah there's there's a lot of creativity but uh, and they're just so relentless in new ideas kirby gets repetitive that's the thing i think <clears throat> you know the end of the game was just a bit too too much like leaning on what they had already done uh you know not not adding enough interesting yeah. new stuff so um yeah kirby kirby's still up there i think but maybe not breaking through the barrier pokemon is an interesting one i think a lot of people are very down on the current current era of pokemon although now the switch up has happened with arceus i think that it's kind of changed things for people um and i don't know if i would even like classify arceus under the uh the kind of banner of more traditional pokemon because i will say it's probably the most fun i've had with a pokemon game since like diamond and pearl uh i i think it's like in terms of a single player experience it definitely was so much more interesting and, and varied and and had a a different approach that i really appreciated uh but if we're talking about the more traditional stuff like sword and shield sword and shield is like fun but it's it feels very shallow and thin um and obviously i'm someone who grew up with the kind of game boy games and you know gold and silver the original are always going to be my favorites when it comes down to that so it's very hard to unseat that like similar to fusion with the nostalgia that i have for it um it's it's difficult to kind of uh you know make an impression there but um yeah i, th- I think the fact that I would say, Bally, you should probably try Pokemon Arceus says a lot, mm. I think, about the state of that game. Yeah, you know? I'm kind of on the fence. But do I do Arceus or do I do Violet and Scarlet? Because I, yeah. I definitely don't really want to do both. But it'd be nice to play one of them this year. I'm not sure if, if I have time. Yeah, Maybe totally. see what the Scarlet and Violet reviews are like, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, Fire Emblem, for me, is kind of a mid-tier game with three houses. I think it has some of the best stuff in the franchise in terms of character development and, like all those interpersonal relationship things like that's some of the best writing we've had in the series but the actual overall story i think there's a good twist and and a great kind of center of that game that really um threw me off my feet but when it comes down to the actual kind of gameplay stuff like the map design and um kind of the strategy of it uh, it was pretty by the numbers it, it was kind of i would say similar to awakening in a way in that like it's solid it's good but it's not like it doesn't have the interesting intricacies of something like a uh, fate's conquest for example or or even like older games in the series like um uh, path of radiance which had really interesting map design with like different elements of like boulders rolling down hills and stuff like that right like it it just felt a little bland to me um and i i wouldn't put it up there as as my favorite in the series and bally you basically got halfway through and just stopped playing it so um, i really bounced off three houses yeah i way prefer the the strategic fire emblems you might say i don't know i, I really like fire emblem seven i really like i thought awakening looking back was maybe a bit easy it does become just yeah. a bit too simple and for that reason right. conquest was too hard so of the mo- more modern Fire Emblems, I do actually like Birthright the most, and I know you'll hate me for saying that. Yeah, no. I really I like Birthright, it. and I really like Fire Emblem 7. And I think that uh, the Japanese kind of like vibe to it probably helped a lot with Birthright. Yeah, that did right? help, yeah. and I like the way those stories came together. Um, I've not played any of the... I guess I played a little bit of Sacred Stones. I do need to go back to that at some point. Yeah. But um, yeah, I Three Houses was it's just like so much bump and chit chat and like there's so little strategy and yeah i really didn't like that at all i think it was like the calendar system right of like going back to the uh it was quite overwhelming and it was like i by the time i was understanding the mechanics it was like god this game's got a lot of like downtime between matches and if you're not enjoying all those new mechanics Mm -hmm. and you just want to do a bit more of the strategy it just feels like not my not my kind of game at all yeah totally get it i totally get it um i think yeah fire Emblem three houses for a lot of people is probably their entry into the series and so by default their favorite but um yeah someone who has played those games for a long time um it, it sits probably squarely in the middle i would say in terms of my appreciation for it um 
I guess some other like weird ones, like there's Yoshi, who I think crafted world. Neither of us have. We've made, we skipped over 2D Mario, but I do think Mario Maker on Switch is definitely gone backwards since the yeah Wii U. it's inferior it's inferior to the wii u version yeah, for sure sure. Um, not quite as good um yeah like yoshi's weird one where he like there's crafted world which i don't think either of us have much interest in i think yoshi still peaked on the super nintendo and no one's ever really like, yeah it's not really been challenged been i do challenged. like woolly world a lot i know world you was have, good um, fun yeah. yeah really nice actually yeah i had a good time you with had that. some issues with that but um i think woolly world is 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 enjoyable probably the best the series has been since the original super nintendo game uh, with mm-hmm. yoshi's mm-hmm. island um and uh and yeah and i guess like um Oh, that was one I was, I was going to say. It's, it's lost from my mind now. But we've got stuff like WarioWare, um, which has come back. And I think mm, yeah. has probably disappointed, honestly. Like, I think also... It's like a middling, but it's, it's, not up, it's not with the top for sure for me. I have recently been playing the original Game Boy Advance one uh, on the train. And um, I mean, it just it's so much more fun because of the challenge of it. Like, I'm legitimately, like, finding it hard sometimes to even get to the the base uh number you need to clear it uh because of how kind of quick and like on it you need to be and i think one of the advantages of that game is it can be very quick because it doesn't have to set up oh what character are you going to play as right um and i did enjoy the character stuff i thought it was an interesting twist but i think like looking back on it now it doesn't it doesn't quite carry the same like spontaneity that you want that warrior wear to have like it mm. because it has a bit more setup it doesn't quite nail it in terms yeah. of uh, a game you know, very much came and went without a ton of chatter that you'd think there was you thought it felt like there was a lot more love for warrior wear when that game came and went it was just like oh wow that was kind of like a it's a good game i really enjoyed it but yeah not being back to it i intended to go back to it but like it feels a bit like a bit of a drop ball by nintendo perhaps yeah um animal crossing is a big one i would say it's the best animal crossing personally. it is the best animal crossing i just kind of I blame Last of Us Part Two for that. My my drop. That's a it's, a it's a weird thing to blame, but yes, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, it made you so depressed that you. Uh... I played that game every single day when it came out until Last of Us Part Two came out. What the end of May? I want to say. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But I, I I do think it's it's the best Animal Crossing. I it just I just dropped off it a bit too quickly yeah totally uh and splatoon is a newer franchise that hasn't had as much time to breathe but i would say splatoon 2 is overall better than splatoon 1 yeah. um just added more right yeah uh, and i'll be interested to see if three what three does to like make that any different um I, it, it feels like one of those series where it just gets better every time because they get better at making online experiences and the types of things that you want to do with it and like hopefully not having salmon run blocked off for like five days because of the weird timing windows and stuff like that you know um yeah uh and uh yeah and i'm sure there's like a bunch of other ones we could dig into there there's like the the problem is there hasn't been a pikmin a new pikmin game they did pikmin 3 deluxe Um, no new donkey kong no new donkey kong yeah tropical freeze got re-released on switch uh so we're getting lots of re-releases um an interesting one i would be is like well, Octopath Traveler is like Bally's favorite JRPG, so I guess if we just want to talk about Square Enix JRPGs as a yeah. genre, uh, that's probably uh, you know up there for you. Um, but but yeah, stuff like Paper Mario has come and been like, well, it's still not there with what people want it to be. Uh, it's not quite the thing that everyone was yearning for with that series. I've got a, and, um, a group of games that have gone completely backwards, and that's Mario sports games. Yes, um, exactly. And I'd throw in like Strikers and that, which I listeners may have noticed i'd never bought and that's because i was just like it's 50 quid these reviews are incredibly middling to not great and Uh i'm just i played the demo and i wasn't loving it um i'm just we were very burned by uh for, I mean, first Mario Tennis came out, which I wasn't that interested in, and people seemed like it was okay, but didn't wasn't kind of didn't have long term uh, longevity. And then uh, Mario Golf came out, and I think it was very underwhelming. Yeah, and it was th- it was underwhelming on top of the fact I've reinforced my belief that the N sixty four game was just so much better by actually playing it and being like, yes, wow, yeah. th- this this is actually just so much more fun. It's tougher. It's brutal it's just there's like a charm to that game that just is lacking with the switch game and i'm glad i was able to go back to that game this year because it, it it's clearly a better game 
Yeah. Um, and I think also the idea that there wasn't really a single player thing for strikers just immediately turned me off. I wasn't that interested in the first place, but like, at least with Mario Golf, I had like a five, six hour campaign to play through. Whereas with strikers, it was like, uh, just do a bunch of matches, I guess. And, and that's going to be it. And that just isn't, that isn't enough for me to, to care about it, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's a bit of a shame. Um, Xenoblade is uh, yet to be seen. Obviously, Xenoblade 2, I don't think, is as good as the first game. The first game is like, man, you're going to have a really hard time beating the first game for me. Like, it is so embedded in my mind as, like, one of my favorite games ever. Um, and just, like, I, I love those characters, the world, the music. It is all so fucking top tier for me. But Xenoblade 3 is coming, and there is potential that it could uh, it could take the top spot there. Um, but, yeah, I I don't think that 2 really hit the the peaks of the series that i wanted it to so i don't think that that is number one uh, in terms of the switch um but we're waiting for it we'll see see what happens with it um and i guess super smash brothers we haven't talked about but um i also would say that i prefer smash 4 to ultimate on an overall level just wow. from a sing from a single player perspective i think that smash ultimate is not very good uh it has like some interesting stuff like uh, the the whole um fucking uh i can't remember what the single player campaign was but uh that that yeah, entire mode as well. um which i don't think you ever finished never Valley. Beat it. <laughs> yeah uh that says a lot i think um i spent a lot of time playing it and was like okay i guess i'm done with this now and uh all the spirit stuff is just bad um obviously it has the best lineup the best roster of characters you could ever ask for which is like incredible but from the ground up as a single player experience smash 4 for me was so much more enjoyable i just spent so much more time doing like all the challenges and, and all the th stuff that they had available there for you as, as well as collecting the trophies it was for me a much richer experience in terms of, of that approach um even though for the most part we do play smash online and you know i think a lot of people will say that yeah ultimate is, is the best one when it comes yeah, to that yeah. um so there's only one yeah. game with sora in it so i mean yeah mm, yeah i think i actually <laughs> probably puts it down another five <laughs> points actually Bally. so uh, thanks for bringing that up because um, uh, yeah one series that I think has definitely easily had the best entry in the series and is one of our favorite games on Switch is Luigi's Mansion. I oh, for 100%. And yes. It's funny talking about how Next Level have gone backwards a bit with the football, but have just done, not done the unthinkable, but done something very unpredictably awesome with Luigi's Mansion 3, where that's a really, really special game and was so much better than I thought it was going to be. And it's so, we were talking about It Takes Two and Odyssey being relentlessly fresh. That game is relentlessly fresh and it feels yes. really good for its 12 hours or however, however long that campaign is. Yeah, totally. Um, it's uh, it's an incredible, incredible game, like absolutely deserves to be up there, you know, in the same breath as Odyssey in terms of like high quality Switch games. And For sure. I, uh, I hope next level I have another project in the works and they weren't just working on Strikers because <laughs> that would be a little bit of a bummer. Judging by the number wait. of modes and Strikers, there's a decent chance that they are working on something else, but we'll yeah. see. I think, like, the the trend that I like the least, that a lot of people have been talking about recently, is this whole idea of Nintendo trying to do games as a service, but not really doing it well, of, like, putting out bare-bones experiences like golf and like tennis and like strikers, and then being like, but we're going to have characters added over time. Like, they did the same with ARMS as well, of like, oh, we'll, we'll ship with this. But yeah, once the, once the player base has dropped from 100 to exactly. 1. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally. Once no one is playing it anymore, yeah. they'll be like, oh, let's, let's add something to this game um and you know the same with mario maker 2 as well like it's just such a disappointment in terms of lack of stuff to do when the game comes out and then they're like well we're gonna do something and then by the time it comes to that point they're like hmm no one's playing this anymore should we even bother there's a lot of areas that nintendo are just completely off the charts when it comes to like understanding their audience and kind of knowing what their audience wants about anything and that the whole attempting the whole free not free to play model but you know games as a service model like it's really something they're consistently dropping the ball with at the moment and yeah um that's a little bit nerve-wracking with a game like splatoon 3 coming out a little bit yeah um but yeah i think that probably covers most things uh i think on balance it's a pretty kind of like even keel of like probably about 50 50 of like games that are the best and games that don't quite make it there um which i think is very impressive honestly for like one system to do that much heavy lifting in terms of a lot of nintendo's core series um is is really cool and you know we still have stuff to wait for like bayonetta 3 and metro prime uh, 4 and stuff like that still coming down the line uh and you know who knows what the second uh, 
uh, Breath of the Wild will do, if that's better than the first, or if it doesn't quite reach it. But in any case, uh, they'll still have the best Zelda. Um, so we we could get a new 2D Mario, a new 2D Zelda. You know, like these are games yes. that might be out there, and I'm pretty confident there'll be a sequel to Dread at some point before the Switch is up. Yeah, I hope so. I certainly hope so. And um, yeah, I think especially with those those core franchises, those big three, uh, those are the ones that I care the most about, and they're the ones that uh, have done the best. So that's uh, that's really good to see. So awesome! Thanks for the question. Our next email is from Chariot Goblin, who says, "Hey TNL, with news of Square Enix selling off the majority of their Western game development to Embracer, many have speculated that they are preparing to be acquired by Sony." If this were to happen, what would this mean for the future of HD 2D, Bravely, and Dragon Quest on Nintendo platforms? Would Sony still allow these games on Nintendo? Uh, Personally, losing Dragon Quest would be disappointing since the series is best for handheld play. Thanks, and keep up the great work. I like how HD 2D is like the name of a new series. It's yeah, it's a it's a genre at it's this genre. point, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, with Live Alive and Triangle Strategy both coming out this year, as well as the Dragon Quest Three remake being announced, like Square Enix, like I am totally happy for them to do that to every single one of their games uh, and and bring it to the Switch. Um, but yeah, it does it does bring up that question. Like it is it is the thing that I would be the most worried about with a Sony acquisition of Square Enix is what does happen to Nintendo because. Nintendo and Square have had an interesting relationship over the years, right? Like, we think back to the Super Nintendo and how core and integral their games were to the identity of that console, and how many classics and all-time games came from that company, um, you know, when that happened. And uh, and then, you know, the PlayStation happened, and Square were like, well, we're going to fuck off now and do Final Fantasy VII over there. And there was this animosity between the companies for a long time. And in that period of time, Square obviously merged with Enix, and Dragon Quest became a part of the family as well. Um, and, uh, you know, and then eventually they kind of came back to Nintendo around the uh, GameCube era, I want to say, with Crystal Chronicles. I think that was kind of the first bridge back um, uh, between a, a Square and Nintendo partnership. And since then, they've they've had a lot of stuff, right? Like, every Nintendo Direct, you expect a Square Enix thing to show up. And lo and behold, the most recent one, we had Harvestella, which is this kind of like farming thing uh, that is uh, is a weird, you know, kind of like mid-budget type of game that is mixing Harvest Moon and JRPGs. And it feels like a lot of those experimental games a lot of those kind of lower budget games are ones that they will take a punt on on a Nintendo console because they aren't as big a triple A investment as stuff like Final Fantasy VII Remake or Rebirth um, or Final Fantasy XVI, right? Like those those are the ones that are the kind of things that carry them um, and and make a lot of their money on on the other consoles. But um, the thing is, Square Enix knows this, and I'm sure Sony are very much aware, uh, you know, being in the market, but japan is like 80 percent dominated by the switch at this point like playstation 5 is doing pretty shit over there Uh, obviously the supply chain is a big issue but when you compare it to like how big the switch is nintendo basically owns the market right now in japan um so like a lot of those games being taken away or at least like put on sony platforms instead with exclusivity i don't i don't know i it feels like to me sony are far more vindictive and far more like um they have a, this sense of ownership over their properties and their kind of like, like deals with their exclusives far more so than Xbox does, where Xbox will be like, yeah, okay, we'll put Ori and we'll put Cuphead on are Switch. There, are there any examples um, of Sony deals that do cross-platform other than like MLB The Show? Not really. I don't think so. Like, that's such um, a like unique, weird thing that... It, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, it does feel like if Sony does acquire Square, it would be the end of those games or the end of those games on nintendo platforms because i think square would probably be still be keen to put them out but maybe if square, maybe started, not. Put, if square started putting them out on say ps5 and they sell crap on that system maybe they could do like delayed exclusives where it launches on sony's platform but then a year later and we've seen octopath come to other systems so like yes yeah maybe they'd still make those games but they just come to switch later or something i don't know yeah, which would be a bit of a, you know, probably... Yeah, that wouldn't be great. Not great, um, because I think m- most of the audience who cares about those games are on Switch, right? Like, it is it is the... If you're interested in JRPGs, the console to own is Switch, right? Like, it, it doesn't make sense to own any other console, unless you want just the big ones, in which case, yeah, you can own a PlayStation, and you can get... Which wasn't the case last generation. Yeah, arguably. I don't think so. Um, obviously, Nintendo were in a very different place last generation, um, and uh, I, I, I think that, like... 
the handheld nature of it because rpgs are just so much nicer in that format i think a lot of people gravitate towards them in that way um i think the big sticking point here is dragon quest uh, as brought up in the email and dragon quest is like it's such an interesting series because it is always the, it always goes to the platform that is the most popular at that point in time in japan right so theoretically it should be going to switch the next one right dragon quest 12 should be on switch and that should be the main platform that's being developed for because it is the current most popular console in japan but if that happens and they make a deal with sony and and suddenly this happens i don't know what happens to that do they suddenly switch gears and it becomes a playstation game exclusively and that's what sony want to use to kind of like push the ps5 in the japanese market because that's also a concern here right is that because sony are not doing great in the japanese market maybe by getting square enix on board they are able to then like position themselves to sell more consoles there and actually get people to buy ps5s instead of going to nintendo because as soon as you take that away from the switch all those people are like well i kind of still want to keep playing those games maybe i do go and buy a ps5 right um and dragon quest is certainly the series to do that with because i mean like it's more popular than anything in japan it is the most popular thing over there you know people there were stories i think back when dragon quest 3 came out of people like a mass uh part of the country was off of work basically the most like calling in sick <laughs> in the history of the country was the day that dragon quest 3 released um and ever since then it's been a thing where like i think a lot of companies in japan they just give their employees the day off whenever dragon quest comes out which is insane like the cultural impact that has had on like the entire country is is just mind-boggling but um but yeah it, it, it's it's such a core thing for that audience that if sony were to acquire square enix and we're like well we're gonna make it exclusive now i can certainly see that happening um but uh what but i don't if, know I, it, it's hard what if square say you know sony we're a bit concerned about like your lack of success in japan at the moment um so part of you acquiring us uh we want part of the deal to be that you will launch another handheld system that you aim specifically <laughs> at japan because yeah. we're concerned that our games won't sell uh in that market yeah no i i mean i don't know man i feel like if there wasn't a chip shortage i think in the next 10 years there's a fairly decent chance of sony doing another handheld at some point i do think they could punt on it at some point yeah i i don't think it's out of the realm of possibility not next five years but next 10 years let's go for that yeah yeah yeah. especially when you look at the steam deck and how successful it's been so far and people are just going wild over it now a lot of that is due to the fact that it's an open platform right so like people are like this device is amazing because i can emulate everything on it and i can the the power disparity between handheld and console is getting smaller a bit like the power disparity between console and pc is getting a bit smaller like we're, yeah we're, we are all progressing where all these things are coming together a bit more than it was say five ten years ago right and i think sony's big issue with the vita and with the psp although the psp was very successful with the vita especially it was well we have to dedicate our teams to making specific games for this handheld versus if you have a handheld platform that is somewhat on par like i mean the steam deck can run god of war right that's fucking crazy it can run elden ring right so if sony had a handheld that was somewhat on par with the ps5 by which i mean can run ps5 games but at 30 fps right like that is a more viable option for them because it means they don't have to worry about their studios dedicated to making games just for that platform they can make games that also run on that platform right um and and that becomes something that's uh you know more widespread because it means that you know everyone can just focus on making their big boy console games right. but also those console games will run on this handheld yeah. as well yeah the that's, only question that's the future when there's enough parity where they don't have to make another version that's the key yeah I, i'd say the only question with that is you know with sony's pc initiative right now the steam deck kind of already is that you know because now you can play horizon the first horizon and god of war on a steam deck and when spider-man comes out later this year when uncharted comes out you'll be able to play all those sony big first party yeah, games that's, that's potentially the avenue you're right and so that's so when yeah i would get a steam deck <laughs> yeah exactly exactly um so it's uh i think it's a possibility um i think we maybe talked about this a little bit in the past but i do think that the worry about square being bought by sony is not uh <laughs> 
I think there's a, a a world in which it doesn't make sense for them just because they already are in bed so deeply with the big games. Like, there's no risk of Final Fantasy 16 being on Xbox first or Rebirth being on Xbox first. And that's really all Sony cares about with the big consoles is, like, having that exclusivity so that people flock to their console for those types of games. Um, it's because Square doesn't really have another option, right? Like, there's no reason for them to do anything with xbox uh, unless you know phil spencer comes along with a dump truck of money for them um, like they have done clearly with kojima right um so that dump truck is getting around town right now though yeah it is it's, it's true so like maybe they should be scared of that dump truck coming <laughs> around the corner but like at the current moment in time they sh- i don't think they need to lock down square enix because i mean where else are, are square enix going to put all their biggest games you know because the switch isn't powerful enough to run those games um no and uh i yeah i do wonder like how important is stuff like triangle strategy or the live alive remake or harvest stellar like these smaller games that square enix puts out in the grand scheme of things how important are they to the financial bottom line compared to final fantasy 7 rebirth and final fantasy 16 and even 14 you know i think they probably have a decent um profit margin compared to those games which is because yes. of the, the cost of games totally. like remake you know and i i think octopath travel did really well and it's obviously a much lower budget than remake but then they yeah. probably also got their you know <laughs> phil spencer did come and give them their game pass money so like yeah i'd be in i think it's probably i would guess it's an important pillar but it isn't the main pillar but it's still an important right. pillar yeah totally no that's a really good point i i do think that when you think about how inflated the budget must have gotten for these big games and final fantasy 16 is probably one of the biggest budget games of all time at this point in yeah time. Like it yeah. can't be far off totally and um and i think that because of that like you see you saw this in the past where square square enix was talking about how all their western games were doing really badly and it's just like poor financial management on their end because they spent way too much money on those projects and then the projects didn't sell well enough to make that money back properly um and i would i would say they're probably a little bit better with their their bigger like japanese games but still i I don't think they're making like massive amounts on it um so yeah i even even though probably it's much lower numbers for those games they probably you're right do 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 a little bit better in terms of profit margin so yeah um i don't know i i do i'm a little worried i'm gonna say but i don't think it's i think there's a world in which you know square enix works out a thing where there can still be certain of their games going to other consoles even if sony owns them right um it also maybe depends on like i think bungie is a good example of this where they are taking no shit from sony and they're like now nah, we're gonna you, you can buy us for our tech or whatever but we're gonna still be cross-platform now i don't think square enix uh have that same kind of bullishness that bungie does Has that been confirmed um, by bungie that's what they said right. yeah they, they're, they're going to remain cross-platform destiny's going to remain cross-platform all that sort of stuff um so i i don't know i don't think i feel like square enix are probably not the same that same kind of like mentality but um yeah. i i would like to be live in a world where even if they were bought if nintendo still got those games that would be really nice you know because i i just don't see them fitting anywhere else in the industry yeah. you know and i do think those um, games We've gone back and forth on like how valuable they are, but I do think they're a valuable part of Square Enix's identity. Like, yes. and they they're the modern incarnation in some ways of you know Final Fantasy VI and these kind of games. Chrono right. Trigger, like, sure, Final Fantasy Remake is another version of a modern incarnation of those games, but mm-hmm. I think that that HD two D thing they've gone for is kind of awesome, and I don't think they'd want to give that up. And obviously, the Switch is just the biggest audience for those kinds of games so yeah we'll see. totally so yeah good good question chariot goblin that's a interesting topic and we'll see how it develops in the coming absolutely, years absolutely yeah uh, but that's all we got time for in this segment for your emails as i said at the top of the segment please email this nintendo life at gmail.com that is this nintendo life at gmail.com if you would like to send in an email but we will be back in the third segment with the jukebox <laughs>
All right, everyone, welcome back to the third and final part of today's show. It's time to come back uh, to the jukebox, which we did a little bit recently, uh, but had a long break before that, but we're back again. Uh, Bally's doing some traveling, so we're uh, doing a little bit of early recording here, and uh, yeah, going to do the jukebox as a fun, consistent thing to do. The, the jukebox and, um, is one of those things where we don't often get it to it often get to it frequently enough but then when we do get to it everyone's like that was awesome like, we love the jukebox you know mm-hmm. like it's, it's a fan favorite yeah for sure uh so it's time for me to destroy bally's life by giving him songs he has no idea about uh no i i chose some stuff here which uh i don't know we'll see how you do i think they're they're gettable um but the question is is how gettable and uh, i guess the rules to lay them out um i have chosen five songs from five games that bally has played on nintendo platforms uh, and we're going to go through them one by one and uh, then bally is going to have to figure out what game they are from doesn't need to give the name of the song or anything that's like super hardcore mode and they're um, games that have never appeared before in the jukebox yes, we yes. are not going back to games yet yet yes uh might happen in the future but for the moment we still have a good pool to to pick from so uh let's get things started off bally uh do you want to listen to song number one here we go basically like <laughs> the violin is very zelda game okay and then the boop, 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 boop uh-huh. is basically just like a some puzzle game <laughs> like just a, just merged with like a zelda game <laughs> um so i was thinking like maybe it actually is a zelda game and what zelda games haven't we covered it's kind of like puzzly probably 2d top down so i was thinking like link's awakening but maybe but then I was like, but is it actually Box Boy? <laughs> it's like that. Boop, 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 boop. Every day I think, but is it Box Boy? So I think, is there any like puzzly indie games I've played that are like have a focus on kind of something a bit more Zelda like, like that kind of style of adventure game in some way? And I just really can't think. So I mean, to, to nudge you, you're going in a good direction with the the zelda thing um, oh hmm in that case i think it might be something like a cadence of high rule because it's like it's a zelda theme but it's remixed so I'm not saying i can remember the actual song in that game that is cadence of high rule but the logic stipulates that it would be a remixed zelda theme to be in a game like cadence of high rule so i think i'm going to go with cadence of high rule is that your final answer? Yes. I'm afraid that's the wrong answer. Oh! You, Bally, were on the right track to begin with. You're like, oh, it could be like Link's Awakening. Is it actually Link's Awakening? It is the Link's Awakening that's remake so on Switch. Yes. Um, so I, I thought I would put this one in here. Uh, not the original Link's Awakening because... Um, I, I was originally going to do like Oracle of Ages, Oracle of Seasons. I was like, ah, oh, I don't know, that might be a bit too harsh. Um, but then I thought if I did the original Link's Awakening, there are a lot of songs in there that are quite recognizable and you'd probably get it quite easily with the Game Boy sounds. So I thought, let's do the remake of Link's Awakening. Mm. Um, and the motif there is a Zelda motif, right? Like that, um, that whole thing. Uh, so I thought you might get it from that being Damn. like, that's quite an obvious Zelda. It is literally a Zelda Damn. motif. So um, God, that's annoying. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think this is the mysterious forest, which is um, 
I think that area with the weird raccoon. Quite early on in the game with the owl, right? Yes, and the raccoon and like the powder the and stuff bo- like that. Bo- 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 it's really weird. Put me off. Yes, it's <laughs> really weird, isn't it? And it's, it's not what really you expected. And off. it's kind of why I chose this track because it like it adds a little bit of uh, uh, uncertainty to it. But yeah, um, I I really liked playing this game, the Link's Awakening remake. I think it had like some issues because the original Link's Awakening has some issues. Um, but as uh, you know, as, as a Zelda game, it's a really fun one, and uh, I think that the the music for the original Link's Awakening is quite iconic as well, right? Like, there's certainly I think if I would have chosen one of the more well-known Link's Awakening songs you probably would have got it quite easily um but uh yeah but yeah um any any thoughts on on Link's Awakening remake and uh I think I enjoyed that game quite a bit more than you but um I, and those dungeons you have an issue with I, I don't mind them quite as much right. I think it's a really strong game I'm still stunned that game came out in a way where there's still like a lot of framey kind of issues with yeah like, the way it, it, it kind of loads or kind of restores itself um but i really enjoyed that game i think i would have maybe liked them to iron out some of the kinks for that game rather than just giving it this massive incredible paint job which i loved uh i but i would really like an original 2d zelda on switch that's my yeah favorite. yeah definitely uh, especially with that style right like just looking at the Link's awakening style it's like oh it's so gorgeous like it has that tilt shift thing and it's all like toy-esque and yeah um, and having played like unsighted and death's door and these other games very recently it's like right okay and tunic you know like yes i'm red they're great games i love those games but like i'm ready for like what nintendo's take is on this genre at this point in time in 2022 because we don't really know what their take is on it and we haven't had a new zelda in a very 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 long time in the 2d space yeah exactly and, and just seeing what happened with metroid dread i'm like well you know i think they can pull it off you know they can do something really special i'm sure so uh, i look forward to that but uh but yeah link's awakening remake really great uh, great soundtrack uh let's move on to song numero dos bringing up the intensity with this one a little bit uh, mm. a little bit uh up there feeling quite boss themey mm-hmm. it's feeling uh, it's got that retro sound to it yeah the retro sound isn't quite clean enough to the point where i think it was a remake but it could be a remake i honestly was thinking super metroid but super metroid has been done before it has so been it yes be super metroid. yeah it's very intense you know actiony yeah that's what i'm feeling for that reason I'm going to go with Contra, but I don't know which one. I can't remember which one we played. Let me check my back. <laughs> oh, great. Was this it is Contra? the problem. Bally has no idea of what Contra game he has played before. We played Contra 3 Alien Wars. I think this is Contra 3 Alien Wars. That is correct. This is oh, Contra 3 The Alien Wars. And you're right. This is a boss theme. Uh, this is fighting against one of the bosses. Um, yeah, I think this this series has a real high kind of uh intense nature to it and so the music d- generally reflects that quite well um and uh yeah it's it's one of those soundtracks that actually kind of stuck with me just because of the amount of time we spent replaying those levels over and over again um that it that kind of like got embedded in, in my skull one track in particular that i used when i did my top 100 games videos um was uh was very very familiar to me so i didn't choose that one but then i realized oh wait that was that it's very familiar to me because i've heard it a million times editing that video uh, but i don't know if it would have been to you or not so i chose a different one but um yeah i i do want to go back and play other contra games together i actually i've downloaded the contra collection i've had it on my switch for like a few years it's just we've not been in person in order to play those we can only do that local right yeah which sucks like i would love yeah. if that stuff had online play but it doesn't um, um so the fact that there's that collection means it's very unlikely these contra games are going to appear in like the switch online right? yeah or, yeah unlikely i would all say konami, aren't they yeah they're all konami yeah. and konami knows nothing but money grubbing <laughs> so uh yeah unless nintendo offers them but gyms and catch them. <laughs> yeah yeah um, um, unless they get a bunch of money to put it on the service i don't think it will be yeah we need to so we need to play like one and two and mm-hmm. 
what's the what's the extreme one that oh god contra hardcore, hardcore. Yeah. yeah 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 so. yeah. Um, yeah i every time that you're like hey man i found this retro game and like it's co-op and we need to just bang our heads together and get through this and it's like i've had a great time every time we've done that so we've done yes. it with contra 3 we've done it with wild guns yeah wild gun was we, great really we did it with wild the con- what's the modern contra game called again oh uh blazing chrome blazing chrome that was a great one uh yeah, I, th- those types of games, co-op, are just some of the most fun co-op I think I've ever had. And totally, yeah. yeah. Contra 3 was kind of the first of those three that we played together. and It was in Brussels, right? That was yeah, it was. So yeah, <laughs> it was over that Caroline weekend thought we when were I came. insane, but it was, it was very fun. We, yeah, we did have to resort to a bunch of save states, and, um, you know, it was fine. Otherwise, we wouldn't have finished the game. It was just like, oh my god, this is so fucking brutal at the end. Yeah. Uh, but it's still it's still a lot of fun. Like I, I wouldn't mind attempting that without save states if you did want to. Like, yeah, no, good. totally. <laughs> uh, I, I think, like, doing Contra 1 would be a good way to do that, because it's a bit of a shorter game, so okay, it's probably yeah. e- easier to do that. But, uh, yeah, at some point, we've got to sit down and, uh, you know, play through some more Contra stuff. It's It's great fun, so... Uh, well done, Bally. You got one. Thank That's you. good. Um, so uh, let's move on to the third song. That is song number three. Now, podcast being an audio medium, obviously no one can see me, but uh, I was dancing along to that song the whole time, Bal. Just dancing in my room, all alone, in front of this computer. <laughs> uh, it's it's great. Uh, I, I have a feeling that that is recognisable to you, uh, and that's kind of the feeling I wanted to, to invoke, but how? where is it recognisable from? That's what I wanted to get from you, you know? Squeeze in a bit of uh, uh, blood from the stone here. <sighs> it just sounds like a good time, doesn't it? It is a great time, it's a yeah. Party a movie about fun time yeah this is like a wee party game but then what if it's like some other t- some other kind of party because it's like some other kind of part some twisted party i mean it's like it sounds like it could be a nintendo first party party uh-huh, right? it's yeah. that level that, that's what that song is like but then right. it's like is it that quality of music or is it like a take on that type of music mm, and i'm thinking more mean. towards it's a take okay. on that type of music and then I'm thinking, like, what's a party game that we like or something like Monkey Ball? Let me have a look at the list. What Monkey Ball have we done before? Have we done a Monkey Ball before? We've done Super remember. Monkey Ball on Wii. Okay. And we've also done Super Monkey Ball Touch and Roll. I love Monkey Ball Love, I guess. So I'm going to say it's not Monkey Ball. Um, and then I'm thinking what other parties and... What other parties have we had in the past? I think it honestly might be Monopoly Party on the GameCube. Because interesting. I okay. feel I feel like it's like you're saying inter- interesting. It's like you're, you're like playing playing me here. It's I like, don't know, Bali. Who could say what this song is and where it's from? Because I feel like I've had that waiting screen loading, waiting for like my mum or dad to come from another room so they can come and play Monopoly Party. Um, to be clear, if you wanted a hint, uh, I I own this game that's yeah i was yeah okay now it's hard so i have played this game yes damn it damn yes it. You, you have not played monopoly Park. i don't i probably played it at your house probably at some have, point but, but yeah it might be one of the games from we play but it sounds too familiar to be a specific game from we play because i feel like we didn't play that game a ton we played it quite a bit but not a yeah ton. and especially at launch it was mainly playing it oh this is hard i'm not this is not going well this you're going not, to scream when you hear it i, I know you. i am you know, I'm I'm gonna go for Monkey Ball actually. 
and yeah, I'm probably gonna go for I'm gonna go banana blitz on Wii. I think I'm wrong, but give it a bash. Uh, is that your final answer? Unfortunately, it is. And unfortunately, it is incorrect. Uh, the correct answer, Bally, is Warrior West Smooth Move. So for <clears throat> Wii. Uh, and that is the level select uh, menu theme for Warrior West Smooth Moves, uh, which I guess I did give you a little bit of a hint at the beginning, saying it's a movie about a game, uh, <laughs> which it is a movie about a game. Uh, and uh, and yeah, this is uh, this is one of those games where I remember the day that I got it. Ali T was over at my house, and me and my sister and Ali T played the entire campaign in like a couple of hours and we were done with it and then i <laughs> yeah. basically finished the entire thing uh, which was a fun thing but we did continue to play it as a as you're right a party game in, in a lot of ways uh, going over to each other's houses and doing the kind of multiplayer of this um the most memorable mini game micro game i should say from smooth moves is the wind waker one where you have to hold it over your head 100 percent. the deku leaf the deku leaf gliding um, over from forest haven onto that island yeah, and a bit a bit similar to what we were talking about in the last segment about uh, WarriorWare and how Get It Together kind of has a little bit too much setup. I think Smooth Moves is the most similar to that in that they basically show you what position to hold the Wii Remote in. Is like, ah, oh, we're going to do the elephant where you hold it like you're a big elephant yeah. nose and like having so the zany. positions beforehand. And it was like presented in this like Zen Japanese way of like, like that very kind of like serene music and then like yeah. the, the image of the Wii Remote in like these fun positions, like almost like yoga in a weird way um <laughs> yeah, that's so. totally what they were going for yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah um yeah it's one of those games that i i kind of i kind of forget about when i think about like the switch launch window it was all about twilight princess and the we launch window you mean we launch window yes. what did i say switch, switch yeah switch yeah. Launch. yeah we launch window where yeah it's all that we play we sports and twilight princess um and then a few months later i think it was mario galaxy right so like that was kind of where a lot of my focus was, but we did definitely play this quite a bit, but not not as much as I thought we thought we would based on the hype leading up to this game, because we were already a big fan of like the DS game. Yeah, Touched, I played so much that, you know the thing where you go in and play individual mini games to get a high score on individual yeah. ones? I did that on Touched for like multiple of those games. Um, so that's how kind of deep I got into that game. Probably because there's just lack of other stuff to do in it. But um... Elsa had like really fun toys which yes. also had high scores there was one with like right. you draw a line and a blob would fall and it would bounce on the line that you drew on the ds screen and yeah it keep going like that stuff was so much fun and felt very like intuitive at the time with the ds right yeah and I, I don't think the multiplayer was quite as strong for smooth moves as it was for the gamecube game like the gamecube game is the king of multiplayer that, that gamecube game is that's one of the best multiplayer games of all time oh yeah 100 like, percent. that's that's i had so much fun at uni playing that with people yeah um, and people would be like, how do you do this game? And it's like, that's the game. you got to work out what, <laughs> what you got to do. <laughs> yeah, the game is to figure out what the game yeah. is. Yeah, uh, that is where we were. So, um, yeah, I yeah, that was. I think that was a good one because it was like very familiar in a way that's like hard to, to kind of uh, get yeah, your brain around. that was but, familiar. Uh, yeah. And I want to look up like the Monopoly Party. Yeah, no, <laughs> go, go and I listen bet you to it Monopoly sounds Party. so similar to that. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Uh, all right, well, let's move on to the fourth song, song number four.
sounds like that kind of anime bullshit kind of game. You got you. Oh, you think t- so? Interesting. <laughs> yeah, sorry, okay. I don't play these kind of games. Ha! Huh, that's uh, that's an interesting <laughs> thing to say. Um, uh, to give you a little bit of a hint, I have not played this game. Uh, so oh, shit. Uh, this is okay. all on you, man. This is your bullshit. So <laughs> this is nothing Goodness. to do with me. Um, this is one hundred percent a you game. Uh, so again, sounds a bit boss fighty. Also, the pool of games I've played that you've not on Nintendo platforms is slim so i feel like if i can pin down what this might be i'll probably get it quite yeah quickly. yeah definitely but i'm not there <laughs> yeah i am not there in the slightest yeah what kind of like uh sense of like the style of game do you get from it or like the the tone of it i guess from from that this is like you know the tone of this is like bayonetta you know this is like i've not played huh. that game yet you know it's kind of like I, yeah i wouldn't say it's bayonetta having played bayonetta but okay I, yeah it's, um, it's somewhat different I mean, obviously like the prime games are games i've played you've not played but like, uh-huh. this definitely isn't metroid prime you're going down a a good route in terms of like sci-fi and um, that's definitely the route to take sci-fi okay mm-hmm. it's too battle like to be like an f-zero gx okay that does fit in with sci-fi i like where you're going battle like is a is a good descriptor i would say I don't play battle sci-fi games that you've not played. <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, I mean, you're going to probably eat your words once you realise what it is. But, oh, uh, God. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going to have to throw in the towel. I think I'm going to go F0GX, but I, I know it's wrong. Uh, that was your final answer, F0GX. That was my final answer. That is incorrect. Bally, uh, there's one series in particular that you play on Nintendo platforms that I do not, that is sci-fi, that is battle Star Fox Zero on oh, Wii U. Oh, good shout. That is uh, that is Corneria from Star Fox Zero, and when I listened to it, I was like, "This is this is a bit more like epic than I would expect from Star Fox game," but uh, it fits tonally. It's um, a very good soundtrack that game, actually. Yeah, um, that is a game. If there's a game I'm going to replug my Wii U in for and give it a bash, it's Star Fox Zero because that it's a very unique experience. Yeah, I would say you're one of the only Star Fox Zero fans <laughs> in the world. So, um... Min Guillaume. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah uh so yeah what what do, what do you think of this as a as a game as a soundtrack uh are you disappointed that you didn't get to it do you think that uh you could have got to it Ooh. perhaps I, I i i wasn't really looking at my wii u games that was maybe a mistake i might have got it if i looked at that but um yeah, I, 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 I don't think I was close to getting it, to be honest. But it's only now that you've told me this is Star Fox Zero, it's reminded me, actually, that game has a really great soundtrack. And it's a, it is a really good game. I think the weak, honestly, the weakest part of that game is the um, there's some levels with like the little hover thing that you're picking up and moving things and that those ones aren't much fun but when you're in like the chicken walker and the r wing and there's like incredible dogfight battles and you've kind of got this unique control option obviously with the bu gamepad and you're moving it around like a, almost like this window that you're looking around and being able to see things so you can like move it to the side and then see an enemy and then move your gun over and shoot them like I can appreciate that the control scheme isn't for everyone, but I really jived with it and thought it was very cool. And it's a short game, but I think it's actually, I think it's a good looking game. I know it's got some ugly textures as a lot of games of the time did, but um, I think it's a very cool game and it's a shame that it kind of got so much flack. Um, Yeah, for sure. And I hope it, I hope this isn't the game that killed off Star Fox because I think just they're a cool group of characters and that world is fun and cool. And, even if you make something, I don't know. I we've talked about this before, but like, just open it up. Like, we, we got stuff like you know, we've had No Man's Sky, and we've got what's it called on uh, Xbox coming? Oh, Starfield, yeah, Starfield. You know, like that's the future of sci-fi games. To be honest, it's about open world. It's about exploration. It's about these kinds of things. And I don't know how much Nintendo fans want another linear space shooting star fox really i think that that series needs a little reinvention yeah i mean it's very rooted in like an arcadey style of of gameplay right like it's it's always been built in a way that feels like it could have you could have gone to an arcade and played a star fox game right that's the kind of experience it is um, yeah so yeah and and this game mixed up the formula a lot in my view actually where 
I, I really did enjoy the chicken walker levels and yeah for me this game felt a lot more like a rogue squad squadron game where it does mix up the right the kind of what you have to do and those kinds of things and it's not just this linear shooter as much as i i did enjoy star fox 64 on the 3ds like, that's a that's a good game but yeah. i much preferred star fox zero it's got a lot more diversity in what you're doing especially and i've said that before like the dog fights are so much fun in this game like i've play dog fights in um rogue squad and just with like other humans like including you and Zen, mm-hmm. it is not much fun at all like it really isn't and stuff Fox zero does a great job of giving you the tools to like identify your opponent and then angle your ship in a way that feels very satisfying as to like right i'm lining up my shot and now i'm gonna um shoot like star wolf or whoever it is at the time like the dog fights feel quite grounded in a way that i think the game doesn't deserve flack for but yeah yeah totally fair um and uh yeah sounds like uh the soundtrack really elevates it as well like gives it that grandiose quality that uh i didn't expect oh yeah it is it's blockbuster for sure it's definitely it's, it's yeah. a good game sweet well are you interested in trying it out at some point uh if they bring it to switch i might uh might give it a go but it's one of those weird games where they can't really bring it to switch and have the same experience it was built around yeah the wii u. and that alongside xenoblade chronicles x is maybe like two of the only games that are left on wii u exactly like, i yeah. can't think of many others Star Fox assault as well was another game alongside this game that i played and really enjoyed it's like a tower defense game um, yeah yeah which is very weird but it's really fun to like use the wii u gamepad but really fun couple of games i think i bought them as like some sort of double pack and they were ridiculously cheap because the wii u was so uh-huh it's deathbed at that point in time. back in like the day when um, i think my copy of splatoon 2 cost 25 quid on amazon that's how uh, how much wow, it was at yeah. launch that's the Good wii u day paying for that you. much for splatoon 3 absolutely yeah man i'm gonna have to try and find some kind of deal because that game is gonna be expensive when it comes out um awesome well Ooh, let's move tough, on tough songs tough songs. yeah yeah well this is probably the <laughs> hardest one i'm gonna tell you so uh oh so it does the strain does not stop here let's listen to song number five let's do it So with this one being a bit uh, tricky, I'll give you a bit more of a hint. Um, this is an indie game. Uh, I, I I got that from it for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's also probably one you haven't thought about or have forgotten you've played or have uh, not yeah <laughs> in, in a while. So um, that's mm. what I'll uh, I'll put out mm. there for you because uh, I know there's a lot to wade through. We've played at this point. I remember about I, I went back and listened to that um, episode where you played Trine Two for the first time. You're like, I have played an indie game for the first time. <laughs> And it's so quaint, and now you I've come played to like fifty. Yeah, you come to now and just like, oh my god, oh. all I've played is indie games the last ten years of my life. So yeah, exactly. Um, I immediately thought Thomas was alone. But Interesting. We've done okay. That before. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I didn't realize we had. And yeah, I'm thinking indie. So yeah, I was already on those lines, and you know it also shares a similarity with one of the games that uh we have done as a song here today. Um. So, in terms of the style of game that it is, I was going to say it's like got this ding, 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 sound that sounds like it's straight from Zelda. Sure, yes, I would say that's going along the right lines, of like a, a a Zelda style of game. Yeah, I whatever this is, I did play it a long time ago, um, but that tune is in my head. Interesting. Okay. Um, 
because I've played this as well, but I do I didn't quite remember the soundtrack for this game. So um, oh yeah, I this is def that song is in my head for sure. Interesting. Kind of thinking it's like wait, you think this is like an old indie game? No, not super old. I, it's probably one you've played and forgotten that you've played, or maybe like it's not. Yeah, I don't know. It's not maybe one you. It's not a go to indie game you would think to talk about probably. Yeah, um, I'm pretty confident it might be like minute. It's got that like sound to it and that was a game that i very much kind of think it might have been leaving game pass and i was like i'm gonna play a minute everyone's talked about a minute and i had a good time with that game i don't have much special to say about it but the soundtrack was definitely a highlight it's the like ding 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 like zelda suit yeah, song yeah. at the end it sounds and you did say this game is a little bit zelda like minutes a little bit zelda like so um I think I'm going to stick with minute. I'm going to go through right. a minute. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. Bally, that's correct. Yes. You got it right. Yes. <laughs> Obviously, I had to do a lot of kind of leading you there, but uh, I think it was <laughs> it was a hard song. It's a hard one to do, uh, so uh, worth doing. Uh, it's actually, that song is actually called Minutes Awakening, which is why I was uh, ah. also linking it to Link's Awakening. Uh, so they do you do the Zelda link. That's I think so. Yeah, it must be like it. a little bit of a nod because you can hear it in the song for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it is a Zelda kind of game. Uh, like it, it has, I guess it is like the trading quest really from Link's Awakening. So it probably is the most similar to that game in that way because a lot of what, what you do in that game is get items from one person, give it to another person and you only have, as the game implies, one minute to do these individual runs and the way yeah. you kind of get around the world is you have one starting base and um i remember a really funny part of the beginning where you go to the lighthouse and you start talking to that guy and his dialogue just goes really slowly yeah so you you have to like <laughs> spend a whole minute just talking to him just to get what he says there's a lot of good jokes in there I, yeah i i think i would have liked this game a lot more if i hadn't had to use a guide like twice i was getting so close to wrapping everything up at the end and i just yeah. couldn't make it click i remember there was one section that was real i got confused about as well it was like a submarine mask or something that a guy had that i couldn't figure out but and, in the um, end what was tripping me up was the fact it was a black and white game and the right. pixel art wasn't clear enough to me as to what it was okay and it didn't indicate it well enough. it didn't yeah. indicate it well and that, i felt that was a real shame because i do like the black and white aesthetic i think it works for this style of game totally but I just, yeah i just if, if I'd been able to click on those two little challenges quite near the end, I think I would have felt a lot more positive about the game. Yeah. Um, but I think it, I think it's a really cool game. I think it only took like three hours. Yeah, I it's pretty remember. short, isn't it? It's quite um, short. It's longer than a minute, but it's pretty yeah, short. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And no, it's, it's really clever in the way that it does that stuff because you would think, oh man, if I have to start from the starting location every time, how am I going to explore the whole of the world in yeah. just a minute? But they basically change it up so you can switch your starting location so you can get to a new area kind of set that as your home point and then you have a minute from that point to move forward so like getting to the desert area and going through there and like there's lots of different sections of the game and the world kind of like loops back on itself really nicely um yeah i think it's a really really clever idea for a game and uh i generally liked it quite a bit so yeah, yeah it, it's really cool i i think in all these discussions about time looping games which were so hot the last couple of years you know this is definitely in that mix and it's, i've not played a ton of time looping games but this is one i did play and i enjoyed it it's, it's cool yeah it's like it's like this weird mix of roguelike with zelda with um with yeah time kind of uh looping stuff going on and there is a bit of combat in in it but it's like very light it's much more about the puzzle solving element of talking to npcs and kind of figuring out what to do next basically um so yeah uh soundtrack very good as well uh i i, I enjoyed it um quite a bit very so. good soundtrack yeah yeah really it is a very thomas was alone soundtrack actually like that song really reminded me of that game yeah definitely it's like um, very synthy but in this kind of chill relaxed vibes kind right of way. you might almost expect it to have a more upbeat soundtrack of like oh panic you've only got a minute to go but it actually is quite a chill kind of laid back soundtrack which i think helps yeah it could have gone for a very orchestrated zelda style soundtrack if it wanted yeah. but uh, it, what they went for worked yeah i think it's a nice like um it fits or it, it goes in opposition to the idea of it being like this tense thing and it kind of almost calms you down and and makes you feel like you don't have to worry too much about the time limit i think um, yeah. which is a nice counterbalance uh, yeah. for sure so good stuff so there you go bally two uh, out of five you, you got two yeah, out of five i should have got three out of five god link's awakening really flummoxed me there that, ugh, 
yeah. cadence of high rule, honestly. No, it was, it was tricky for sure. Um, and yeah, I had to had you <laughs> give you a bit more of, of hints on certain ones. But I think by this point in time, the number of games that we have uh, available to choose from uh, and the stuff that is not as obvious is uh, it always gets harder and harder, doesn't it? It so, does get so, harder. You know, it does get harder. Um, but but yeah, no, I really. I find myself like right. This game is so obscure that for MBZ to have a chance of getting it, I basically have to use the main menu theme or something. Exactly. You know? Like you yes. go a lot for more for the main themes totally yeah which is why i chose corneria for star fox zero and i tried to yeah i think i just chose the main the le- main level select theme for smooth moves and i think um yeah uh contra was also like a a relatively uh obvious one i, I tried to uh do that and not be too obscure and now i've given you i've given you a gimme in the future to use the monopoly party uh main menu yes you have point, i think so. you've brought that up multiple times trying to guess stuff before you <laughs> always go back to monopoly party for some reason and i refuse to use it so you who knows you, you you'll never expect monopoly it. party was referenced very recently on rfn yeah actually, so. you'll never see it coming bali is what they say oh, and God. uh and sometime soon monopoly party will come for you those um, were tough but fair i i thought okay, those were cool. good picks those Thank were you. good picks yeah. I, I i don't think i was i think warrior was the one i was never going to get i could have maybe got star fox really yeah. that's see because to me that was the one that i thought like he might have this nostalgic like nugget in the back of his head that will be able to pull out but um yeah it was definitely uh a hard one i mean the good news is all of these songs were in my head yes like they were all there which i think is always a good start definitely yeah yeah certainly helps um so yeah there you go that's jukebox but i got two out of five uh beat my score last time of, of one out of five so uh well done uh, in, in besting me there. But uh, yeah, we'll, well, I guess we'll come back with this at some point in the future uh, and uh, and continue to do it because it's a lot of fun. And uh, if you did play along at home, let us know how you did. Uh, hop on Discord, let us know, or uh, obviously email us, um, Bally. Before we uh, wrap up here, let's uh, talk about all the things that uh, people can do for us, such as sending emails to the show. Where can they send them? Please send them to thisnintendolife at gmail.com. That is thisnintendolife at gmail.com fantastic uh and you can also of course join in the discord server and post emails there but also just hop in and have a chat with people and uh talk about video games that are coming out things you're playing um and yeah have have some fun chats so uh yeah link to that in the description you can join that uh whenever you can also um obviously hop over to our youtube channel where we have the podcast go up there as well uh with all the timestamps and everything if you are more of a person who likes to listen on your computer and have it in a different tab uh which i know i certainly am at a certain point of time so yeah it's a good way to listen to the show you can also listen to the show in other places such as on apple Podcasts or on spotify uh, or on any podcasting app that you have available to you just search for this nintendo life you should be able to find us and uh yeah spotify is a good place to go uh, review us if you uh, listen over there then then uh, do you go in and five star us on spotify uh, that would be fantastic we would very much appreciate it uh, you can find us obviously in other places on the internet such as twitter.com bally where can they find you find me on twitter at ballyman 91 as b-a-l-l-y-m-a-n 91 fantastic you can find me at lord nbz you can also uh, go ahead and follow the twitter account for the podcast itself which is at tnl podcast which again has links to all the stuff that we mentioned discord youtube channel um, and uh, email address and all, all those fun things so if you ever forget head over there and take a look um Obviously, we have uh, people who support this show uh, and make it happen, make the gears turn, uh, and those are our patrons. And Bali, we'd like to thank some folks, uh, especially uh, a new patron who has joined as well. Yes, thank you to our new pa- patron. That's Dapper Danko. Thank you so much for your support. But thank you also to our $10 tier patrons. They are Zach S, Atari Alex, Thomas, Matthew, and Albert. Thank you all for your $10 tier support. But thank you to all of our other patrons. Um, it's hugely appreciated, the support, the generosity, you have in supporting our show uh, we absolutely hugely appreciate it yes thank you everybody and uh, of course you can go and get bonus episodes and uh, extra conversations and stuff like that if you would so like to support i've started so. elden ring as we mentioned yes and mz's yeah. nearing the well he's now beaten it but when we recorded the patreon show he hadn't been it's a no it's a long back to the future kind of conversation yeah, i'm of trying course. to discuss <laughs> yeah. here but he's before and after the end of elden ring um, yeah which is exactly good to talk about absolutely yeah so uh enjoy that uh that's a good good fun conversation and uh yeah we'll be back in a couple more weeks time uh to talk about some more video games i'm looking at my calendar bally i think that next time we chat xenoblade 3 will be out uh oh, so boy. yeah uh expect what like, date is xenoblade 3 um it's coming 29th of july um so i'm pretty sure that when this episode goes live uh you will have 
uh, played, or I will have played it oh, for a full... Live Alive is 22nd. It is, yeah. So Live Alive coming out and Xenoblade 3 coming out. So I'm pretty sure I will have got a, a at least one weekend with Live Alive and a full-blown weekend of Xenoblade 3, which probably means about 50 hours, let's say, in about <laughs> yeah. uh, three days. So looking forward to chatting about that when it happens but uh, of course we'll we'll get to that at the time um but until then thanks everybody for listening and we'll see you very soon bye bye folks Musical interludes used on today's show were A Cyber's World and Pandora Palace, both from Deltarune Chapter 2, copyright Toby Fox 2021.